Welcome everyone. And thank you for joining us for tonight's examination of the language we refer, we refer to as elder speak, where it comes into play in aging services and beyond, and what we can do to recognize and eliminate it in ourselves and in the community. My name is Kate Ingalls Maloney. I'm the Director of Technology Integration and Education at Cassia. I'll be hosting tonight's presentation and hope you'll join us for future programming as we continue to develop Cassia Online Education. I have just a few housekeeping points to make uh, to help you navigate the webinar before we get started. We recommend that you turn up the volume on your device uh, for the best audio experience and note that we have turned off all of your cameras and microphones to preserve the quality of the Zoom transmission. At the end, will you please use the chat function you'll see below in, uh, at the bottom of your Zoom screen to submit questions. And you can do this throughout the presentation as a, as a question arises. Um, however, the responses won't be shared until we um, get to a designated Q&A time at the, at the end of the presentation. Now, just one last thing here before we, we get to Patty's uh, talk, I would like to share just a few defining features of the Cassia organization. Elam Care and Augustana Care were two long established aging services organizations and they merged, joined together in 2018. The, the name was Cassia, the name that was chosen was Cassia. Together, they represent over 200 years of history in human services and several decades in healthcare and housing for older adults. The name Cassie was cho chosen for an anointing oil that's said to symbolize the heart of a servant. It was chosen because it was so perfectly represented, uh, it so perfectly re represented Cassie's mission. And the yellow blossoms you see at the top of the screen in the banner come from the Cassia tree the, uh, from which the oil is derived. At this time, Cassia has over 5,000 employees and 1,500 volunteers who touch the lives of over 15,000 people of all faiths and backgrounds every year. The Cassia community is guided by the following eight core values daily, compassion, integrity, excellence, innovation, stewardship, unity, respect, and collaboration. And feel free to, if you wanna learn more, uh, a little more in depth about Cassia, please join us at our website. And now I am very pleased to present Patty Crawford, our speaker. Patty's in her 44th year of serving older adults, first through Augustana Care and now Cassia. She earned her undergraduate and graduate degrees from Augsburg, her graduate research topic was elder speak and identity subversion, a leadership challenge in elder services. So you can see she's been addressing this topic for quite a while. Using a cross-disciplinary approach and with years of experience in the field, Patty reveals the pervasiveness of this ageist linguistic style in care and social settings and the impact it has on an individual's self-esteem and wellness. Her approach will challenge you to think about what really happens as we age in America. Just a little more, Patty uh, is currently the Director of Engagement at Cassia and the lead spokesperson for our mission and core values. She could not be more suited for this role with her deeply reflective yet highly approachable style. And now Patty, I'm gonna turn this over to you if you would like to move to your, to your slide. Well, thank you, Kate. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, and welcome tonight to examining elder speak, how it hurts and how to change. The subject of elder speak is very close to my heart. As Kate mentioned, I've spent my entire career in elder services. I gravitated to the profession very early, finding great comfort in the presence of the old. I remember my dad telling me how he'd find me in the back of church with the elder gentleman. I have also put hours of thought into my own aging. 
you can do the math at home. I'm, I've been in this work for 44 years. So I do a lot of thinking about my own aging process. I found a quote the other day when I was reading the, some of the works of Donald Hall. He was our poet laureate. He's been, he wrote memoirs at the end of his life. And he said, after a life of loving the old, by natural law, I turn old myself. My journey to this topic of elder speak started a few years ago when I returned to graduate school studying leadership. A class assignment in my language leadership class required me to write an ethnography. That's a, that's a word by word um, document about a, about a conversation. Our, my instructor wanted a typical staff meeting. The goal of that exercise was to learn more about leadership styles, about workplace dynamics, about work culture. At that time, I was working at our adult day center. I was the only one in my graduate school cohort who was working in elder services. So I dutifully did my assignment, capturing the dialogue, the pace of a staff meeting, everything from following the agenda to somebody offering bars that they brought in and were in the kitchen. But then something unusual happened. A client entered the room and suddenly everything changed. The tones, the words, the pacing. Well, I, I thought my assignment was completely awash. And when I talked to my professor about my plight, he pointed out that I had stumbled on a linguistic topic that was not widely researched, but I should look further. I didn't know that my flop of an assignment would actually be an important part of my future. Combining this with the thoughts about my own aging, I realized something. I realized what I feared most about getting old in this world. You lose many things as you age, you lose friends. But what I was fearing most was losing authentic communication and authentic relationships with others. So for tonight, here are some goals that um, I hope to fulfill. First of all, I want to set the scene, the scene against the backdrop of ageism in our society. Then I would like to define elder speak. Some of you probably already know what that is, but I want to put some definition around that and what it actually assumes about aging. I want to dive back into the early research about elder speak. And then the connection that I've made in my writing, I want to examine its impact on identity. But what is, what is it if we only have a problem? I then want to give you some interventions for those of you who are working in aging services. I often think about what day do I become old and what does that mean? I actually found great comfort the other day when I got something from social security. They sent me a document that told me, statistically speaking, how long I was going to live. My response was, at least someone has an answer and I'll go with it. It's far enough away still for me to feel comfortable with it. But I thought about my role models, first of all. Here you'll see them in front of you. This is my gene pool, welcome to it. Um, my great grandmother is the third one from the left. I started to look at what my definition of aging was. Um, ironically, I look at this picture now and I realize many of those women are younger than I am at the, this very moment. But I also, in doing this, I thought about my unconscious bias. Working in the field that I do, oh, here's another piece of my gene pool, grandma, third from the left. 
But working in the field that I do, I have some unconscious bias about aging. I assumed that a large percentage of the population ended their lives in long-term care. But the reality is only about 4% of elders and their see the end of their life in a long-term care setting. My father had the same bias. He pointed at our local care facility and said, well, that's where we all end up. But we do live in an ageist society, even though I have these strong role models in front of me. And even though I have a love for the old, that has not eliminated some of my biases. Birthday cards will tell you that. If you go to uh, your local card shop, up to Walgreens in my case, you will find out that you are over the hill pretty quickly, about the age of 50, that you have lost control of your body functions. And then if you think about the, about the anti-aging industry, meaning like skin care, about $62 billion a year are made by anti-aging. We have survived the era of successful aging with its images of affluence, its images of health and purpose and the idea of retirement being a long vacation. The images that they were showing us at that time were actually five to 10 years younger than the target market they were selling to. They didn't think that reality would sell and they were right. Ageism is not an exclusive young to old phenomenon. If you want to test that theory, evaluate how people feel when they get their first walker. But ageism is very harmful. Ageism dissolves our accomplishments. The, the accolades leave us only to return when they're folded up in our obituaries. During the time in between, we have some choices. We can be sweet, we can be grumpy, we can be cute, we can be feisty, we can be cantankerous, all ages definitions. People will try to be kind with a patronizing smile. We start to speak to others of our maladies, our medicines. We're so unprepared and shocked because society doesn't give us the chance about these things that happen naturally to our body as we age. We are reminded of that during the night when we are awake. We are distracted by death as the generation before us leaves and we become the next in line. I was brought up a country girl, but that feels like to me is like walking out of the protective grove of trees. And then when you suddenly feel the true strength of the wind we think about very important things at the beginning of our aging. And we want to talk to others about them. But the others may seem behind a glass, smiling and nodding. If the language is not available, if the language changes, their tones might come at us high pitched and without meaning. When this becomes your language environment, your life recedes, your accomplishments, your inventions, your experiences, your loves, and the lessons fall away because it becomes just too much to explain. It's important to listen to the voices that are inhabiting that region. In front of you, you'll see an image of Donald Hall as I mentioned before, he was a past poet laureate and recipient of the Nat National Medal of Honor. He was such a voice. A passage from his book, Essays After 80, presents a clear, clear example of what he experienced. This is an episode he experienced in a museum. And this is what he writes. 
Sometimes the reaction to antiquity becomes a farce. I go to Washington to receive the National Medal of Arts, and I arrive two days early to look at the paintings. At the National Gallery of Art, Linda, that was his friend and support, pushes me in a wheelchair from painting to painting. We stop by a Henry Moore carving, a museum guard, a man in his 60s with a small salt and pepper mustache approaches us and helpfully tells us the name of the sculptor. I wrote a book about Moore and I knew him well. Linda and I separately think of mentioning my connection, but instantly suppress the notion egotistic and maybe embarrassing to the guard. A couple hours later, we emerge from the cafeteria and see the same man who asks Linda if she enjoyed her lunch. Then he bends over to address me, wags his finger, smiles a grotesque smile, and raises his voice to ask, did you have a nice din-din? That is both an example of elder speak and an example of what can be lost, the opportunities that can be lost. Elder speak in the literature, if you research this, is often referred to as secondary baby talk. Think of that guard, that guard who's obviously interested in art. He lost the opportunity to talk to a foremost authority about that subject because of the assumptions he made about, about aging. Later, Donald Hall did write a letter to that guard and thanked him for what he did, it opened up a whole new world where he found out more about aging and moved more into memoir writing. But what is elder speak? Elder speak is a modified speech pattern. It's, it's marked by increased volume, simplified syntax, diminutives, collective pronouns, and terms of endearment. Elder speak, as I said, was something that is sometimes referred to as secondary baby talk. There are some theories about, about why this moved into the element of care. But secondary baby talk, uh, we could probably blame Shakespeare for that and, and his stages of, of man. The first research on elder speak was done by Corporeal in 1981. I was already starting in my career, but they broke ground on the subject and they showed that baby talk was a significant part of the speech environment of institutionalized elders. Studies of intent revealed that younger listeners felt that the language was nurturing and caring. And I think that's an important piece to remember is that the people who use elder speak are caring and they mean to be caring. It's just that they're not aware of what happens. Whereas elders did not find it nurturing and caring, they most found it patronizing or that the speaker was actually trying to be nice. What it didn't do, what it doesn't do is provide authentic connection and the avenue for meaningful conversation. Elder speak manifests itself in other ways especially in the medical profession. A few years ago, my sister and I were at a doctor's appointment with my father at a VA facility. Dad was hard of hearing, but he was very aware of what was going on and animated in conversation. The doctor was also an older gentleman. He started asking questions. I suggested he asked my father, and that's when the doctor told me he didn't have time. I reminded him that everyone else at the VA had time to stop and thank dad for his service. He continued to ask me the questions and I turned to dad and I said, what do you think about that dad? Soon the convoluted game of tel telephone proved to be too much. And he went back to talking to my father and laughing, by the way. I am not sure whether lessons were learned that day, but I am sure 
that my father got to participate in treatment decisions about his own body. When I first read the Caporeal study, I was a little tripped up. The idea of the institution that conjured images for me of the 1950s, the 1960s. But I was so glad that it brought me to Irving Goffman. Irving Goffman was a sociologist in the 60s, and he wrote a lot about institutions, about stigma, about presentation of self. How he defined the total institution as a social arrangement which regulates under one roof and according to a rational plan, all spheres of an individual's life sleeping, eating, playing, working. My definition was, was enlarging. I realized that a total institution could be any environment. It could be an assisted living, it could be housing. And then one day I was heading off to Chicago and I, went, I got to the airport and I realized that an institution doesn't have to be inside a set wall. TSA tells you what to do when you travel. You don't make waves, you follow the rules because you have an end goal of getting to your destination. And it opened the door. Irving Goffman opened the door, <coughs> excuse me, to the, um, to the idea of the institution to the idea of identity mixed with elder speak. Elder speak is more than an annoying habit. It assumes that the listener is incompetent. It increases the distance between speaker and listen, listener. And as you see in this slide, it, it creates an uneven distribution of power. And there's a lot of work being done in, in power relationships in caregiving. It ignores the life experience of the listener, prevents meaningful exchanges of stories. Elder speak is artificially cheerful, removing the op opportunity for that empathetic listening. On top of that, it supports ageism, negative images of aging. It lowers self-esteem, it increases depression, which leads to e increased dementia. It is in this gap, and I think this slide, it's in that gap, in that power structure that makes the elder the other. It moves closer to what German philosopher Martin Buber referred to as the I and the it, rather than the ultimate, the I and the thou. This dehumanization is a dangerous sign and is a realm where abuse can flourish. During the pandemic, voices were heard saying, I, I stood over my radio because people were just about to say, it's only old people who are dying. A New York Times opinion piece blasted that aspect that people were on the edge of saying and told about the faulty, the faulty thought process that went into that. This opinion piece read, this matters in the era of COVID-19 because in a culture that persists in ignoring the last century's huge gains in longevity and the obvious difference between young and much older adults, we're unable to address the needs of older Americans. It matters because the isolation necessary for slowing the rate of contagion will also cause irreparable harm to health and have both short and long-term economic effects. And it matters because we accept the second class citizenship of an entire category of human beings. We set a precedent for treating others with the same disregard. Here is an image of how elder speak can affect well-being. It's a negative feedback loop. Things happen in life, things happen as you age. And when they happen at a certain time in your aging process, this scenario may start. 
say you have a healthcare need. Uh, I'll use myself an example. Um, every year I put storm windows on my house in the fall. What if this year I tumble off the ladder? I'm interrupted by my vulnerability. Besides the physical aspect of the problem, and I'm sure many of you have experienced this, there are all those other thoughts that go through your head. How will I do this? How will I cope? How does this change thing? How can I, how can I? All these thoughts, and you're heading off into a medical system. Well, in that medical system, you feel absolutely in the dumps. Your self-esteem is lowered. But then when you get into an institution, those lowered self images are reinforced by language. And they're reinforced by language because they may be reading the age on the paper, the color of your hair, the type of injury you suffered. Well, it's reinforced this, you may move to a rehab center. Now, the purpose, everyone's purpose in these settings is for a quick and positive recovery for you. But you really can't fight back when you're injured already. You can't fight back, you can't even move because you're in pain. Everyone in the room wants that positive outcome. The situation moves from a hospital, it moves to a rehab without a break in the language environment. It leads to increased depression, emotional isolation. And when you have this little triad of emotional isolation and depression, short on the heels comes increased dependence, which it leads to increased healthcare needs, lowered self-esteem reinforced by the language. This is not a good scenario for rehab. Now imagine if this is a permanent move and from there you go to an assisted living or long-term care. Identity can be compromised by disempowerment, by infantilization, by outpacing, by ignoring, by mockery, by disparagement. Those are the words of Tom Kitwood in Dementia Reconsidered a brilliant man who worked, we have lost him to this world, but he left behind a legacy of understanding what happens to an individual when their identity is compromised. Goffman also, since I now was such a nut about Goffman, he talked about spoiled identities. He talked about stigma. And stigma is a process by which the reactions of other spoil your normal identity. We physically change as we age. We look different. Our bodies change. I believe that would fit into his category of abomination of the body. This is so hard on the individual psyche. It makes a difference when we suddenly move into a world where we are spoke to in a different manner, where we feel like a second-class citizen, not in control. Language reinforces that tragedy when we lack genuine conver conversation to negotiate our way, because much of this segment of life is negotiation. Now, people do respond differently to elder speak. Some try to break the preconceived notion by challenging the assumption Picture a person who suddenly swears or shows anger, a person who never has done that before. It's a way of saying, I am not who you think I am. Believe me, I've gone back and thought about those early years when I worked in long-term care. I remember denture cups being thrown at me and I wonder what I was saying to those folks. And that's back when denture cups were made out of stainless steel. Other people may respond by saying, oh, well, they're well-meaning and they don't have the energy or the will to put up the fight. Some remain silent and move into another level of silence. They may, they may turn around and use a sing-songy manner of speaking, adapting to the language culture. 
but it does render conversation rather meaningless. I have some good news. There are interventions. There are things we can actually do about this. First of all, we'll look at some things that organizations can do. For those of you out there who are in, in the work, uh, the same type of work that I am, or working in the medical profession, there are interventions. The first one is awareness. Awareness and all the research, research has proved to be the greatest influencer of changing the habit of elder speak. In, in elder services, remembering the uniqueness of those we serve is of the ultimate importance because age has little or nothing to do with our personalities. Life experience has a lot more influence on who we are. And then we should cultivate the mindset of personal choice. Personal choice is not just about mealtime. And I want you to think now, as you're listening to this, what are some non-negotiables for you? I was, I was thinking today how I find it essential to be outside for some part of my day. Not for a long term, but I need to have my nose out the door. I don't care how cold it is. I like to experience the weather and the world. Value authentic conversations with deep listening. Ah, I channel my father here. He says, cheerful people are so annoying. And he referred to some caregivers as the tyranny of the cheerful. It seems, at least in my early work, I was constantly trying to cheer people up from old age and they really didn't need cheering up. Studies have shown that elders can be outside of an institution happier than the general population. And that a positive attitude about your aging adds about 7.5 years to your life. You get a hold of that. Where this is important and why we would want to make these interven interventions, I want you to look at something that many of you have possibly seen before. It's Maslow's hierarchy of need. And this is, you need number one before you can get to safety needs. You need safety needs before you can get to social needs. Where elders speak and language environment really come into play is in those esteem needs. And I'm not reading a lot about aging as a time of self-actualization. If we truly did follow Maslow's hierarchy of needs in our life process, we would be moving into an element of to be older is a time of great self-actualization. If you look at society in general, I could go on all day about this pyramid, but that we really have focused on the physiological and the safety needs. And our society has basically built a patio up there where deck furniture would be just fine. We have definitely proved to ourselves during this time of COVID about the social needs. Uh, we now see, we all know what it means not to be social and the impact that has on our personality, on our well being. So the groundbreaking work on this, and talking first about the awareness, teaching CNAs to reduce elder speak holds promise as an approach to improving the social environments in nursing homes. Down here in crediting you know, Christine Williams, Susan Kemper, and Mary Lee Hewitt, they were absolutely the champions of elder speak. They came out of the University of Kansas I believe a couple of them are retired now, um, but they actually did the lion's share of the work on the research. They also found that intervention was so important that they quickly slipped into intervening and working with nursing assistants and working in, with those environments instead of continuing the research. Things that are heard in the work environment. Oh my heavens, I, you, and, you and the business out there, you wouldn't have signed up for this. Um, I believe I have lost my place in my slide, but have you ever heard these things? She is so cute or that little stinker. 
Those are some things that I have heard in the workplace, I'm sorry to say. But first of all, I want you to remember that intervening with people about elder speak, again, we cannot shame. Because people are well-meaning and are trying to be care, trying to exude care. Techniques that I have found very useful in this scenario, say someone in my staff meeting said she is so cute, would be to ask, why do you say that? Pattern the use of more adjectives, of different adjectives. People also are human beings. And so we must avoid labeling them as the complainer, as all the other things that might be labeled in, in a community setting. So those interv so the basic information in that is go deeper, ask questions, and pattern up a philosophy of respect. Conversation with deep listening. Oh, if you haven't read the book, you're not listening. It's, very, it's a very good read. Those who stick to superficialities in their conversations or who are jokey all the time don't know what it's like to give of themselves and therefore have a hard time knowing how to receive. And that goes back to that superficialities is the tyranny of the cheerful that my father would refer to. Another thing that I mentioned earlier is is the use of collective pronouns. Collective pronouns are, are meant to say, let's do this together. I'm with you on this. But what comes out is, are we ready for our bath? My dad would always reply, are you taking one too? An alternative would be to state that the bath is ready. People do refuse, but chances are less if they found those experiences, those care experiences to be meaningful and enjoyable. And the crowning achievement, the goal for a nursing assistant should be when someone says, oh, we have the best talks. And that's to navigate that area is, is absolutely essential. So you want your bath because you have the best talks with that person while having your bath. Also the diminutives, the sweeties and the dears. Uh, most people want to be addressed by their name and, and their preferred name. Few would write on that questionnaire that's handed out, I prefer deary. Then there are the tagline questions. And I always find those so interesting because we're trying to give, give choice, but also we have to recognize our staff are, they're, they're basically in a hurry and have to give the impression that they have all the time in the world. Um, to use the bath scenario again, a tagline would be, are we ready for our bath? Sure we are, here we go. Um, or, oh, I bet you'd rather wear your blue shirt today, meaning that you would rather wear that than the one that's so hard to button on you and will take you more time. But as, as leaders in this, in this field, we should pattern a different speaking style. And again, avoid labeling at all costs. Here's the servant leader, Robert Greenfield. Uh, I, he, he changed the world of leadership and I, I just admire his work. And I, I also appreciate that he had his job as the CEO of AT&T and then he retired, but then his real work began. He had to move into a care um, setting because his wife needed some supportive healthcare services. And here's what he said about that setting. And this just put a chill in my heart. I was working in senior housing at the time what we call community here is synthetic, contrived, far from the real thing. The challenge is to get as close to the real thing as possible, but there will always be a gap. Oh, I want to change that. I don't want there to always be a gap. 
But then there are in interventions for us as individuals. And those are to find meaning in your day and embrace mortality, think about it, talk about it. Leave a positive mark on the every day. Leave a positive mark, no matter how small. Sometimes as you age, it's not about changing the world or upending the tyrant. It's more about planting the seed. And how you do that is seeking out conversations with people of all ages. Seek opportunities for those conversations. Now, I'm not picturing age and my own aging without physical challenges or medical needs. I'm not picturing aging without walkers and without equipment I might need. What I want is aging with communication and meaning. I have some reading suggestions for you tonight. First of all, this chair rocks, a manifesto against ageism by Ashton Applewhite. This will radicalize you about ageism in our society. She also has a very valuable, very usable website with all sorts of resources. I, I just, I, I truly endorse, um, endorse her work. And there's, there, there's an older book, it's called From Aging to Saging, A Revolutionary Approach to Growing Older. And, and this is so, uh, rituals you can put into your day to help you through the aging process. And then just one aside, as I was trying to find this aging saging, I found lots of articles and thought the purpose of my aging would be to grow sage because I now know how to do that too. And then I want to include um, the Donald Hall pieces. Donald Hall, Essays After 80, talks, oh, it, that's the excerpt I read was from that, but he talks a lot about those, those things that happen and, and how he feels about it, his point of view. And, has, and the glorious thing about point of view is how, how he becomes more preoccupied with detail. Um, I always wondered why, and thought when I got older, why do, why do people buy birds in bloom? Well, I know exactly why now, because you start to appreciate those beautiful details in life. His Notes Nearing 90, A Carnival of Losses, is very interesting and more so about reminiscence. Um, he, he goes back in his life and talks about um, the value of, of those things. So now I um, want to open this session to some of the chat questions um, to see what you've been thinking out there in the darkness. Um, so I'll, I'll get my camera on here. Patty, yes. this is Kate and to everybody. I'm having a little trouble seeing the chat. Um, I've had a couple questions come in through Q and A, so mm -hmm. that might be a better option. Um, the other thing I can do is I can, um, unmute people. We have a small enough mm -hmm. group so that I could unmute people and you can ask your questions directly. That's a good idea. Let me, let me do that real quickly. And one of the things that did come in through the, the chat was um, People are asking if they can have access to this. Um, excuse me. People, um, people are asking if they can have access to this presentation after tonight. And yes, we are recording and that will be posted probably on YouTube and, and uh, we can send anybody who wants the link. We can also, we can also send that. I'm having trouble opening my camera. The world of technology is challenging us tonight, Kate. So if anybody would like to talk, I have another question here that came in through Q&A. It is, do elders talk to their caregivers about the way elder speak sounds and feels to them, how it feels, how it impacts them? 
I think that's a, that's a very good question because one of the techniques that they used in interventions was to have um, caregivers interview an elder. And that had, had two, two effects. Um, the first was they actually got to hear what people were thinking and feeling when they were the recipient of elder speak, but it also built the relationship into a more meaningful and genuine relationship. And in, in doing so, they, they seldom use elder speak with someone they know very well or have a more profound relationship with. So, so it was yes. Um, and, and many people say, oh, it doesn't, it, do, it doesn't bother me. But um, sometimes when I walk into like a care facility and the, and the room is quiet and there's all sorts of people in the dining room, I wonder where did conversation go? Um, so, so yes, but inter interviewing people and asking how it feels. But there's, there's so much of life and, and reminiscence has such an important role in our aging process. It's, it's putting our life together, putting the pieces together that I, um, that I feel that we need a more accessible language environment. Okay, thank you. Patty? Yeah? This is your cousin, but I have a question for you. How do you deal with someone who is in a state of dementia for example, a friend of mine called her daughter and the friend is living in a nursing home right now. And she called and said, come and get me out of here. This place is on fire. They're closing the restaurant. What do you say when their mind is not with us? That, that is a very, uh, a very good question, Diane. Um, because as people, as people go into a dementia process, they, there's some speech accommodation has to happen. Um, uh, for instance, a simpli uh, simplifying a sentence, um, not trying to explain too much, um, but elder speak is when, um, when someone is talked at or the tone shifts or, or their emotion is negated. Um, for that person, I would suggest you go right to the emotion. You go to the emotion, there's fear. You sound afraid, please tell me more. Um, and you know, then, then thinking about their life story, if you're a relative, you know these things and, and what have they been through that's, that's made them afraid. But honoring the feeling, I think is absolutely essential. When you don't honor the feeling, that's where you get a whole nother sense of a, a whole nother layer of anger because imagine the paranoia you feel inside that. You do have to go inside the dementia with them. Um, so, so but, but speech accommodation is another piece of that, that when someone is hard of hearing, you do have to talk louder to them. But you need to know, know that first. You just don't talk to every elder in an elevated volume and elevated and simplified syntax. Does that help at all? Yes, thank you. I just wanted to comment too, I am seeing the chat again. Uh, okay. So you can use that as well if you'd rather submit that way. Patty, here's another question. How active are education programs in making students aware of elder speak? Is this in most curricula for students entering aging services? You mentioned CNAs, but they're social workers and lots of others. We, you know, at Cassie, I've done some training within the organization. I've also had the opportunity to speak to social workers at St. Catherine about elder speak. So it's, it, when I do a presentation in person, which seems like a century ago, by the way, I, I do have people raise their hand. Do you, have you heard of elder speak? Do you have, and, and many people now, in the beginning, no one knew what I was talking about. So over, over the past five years, there's been uh, heightened awareness. There's been articles in the New York Times about it. Um, it's been addressed in the Star Tribune. Um, so there's, there's much more, more press about it. I think once people realize 
um, the change that can come about when you have authentic communication, because it's that's where we learn. The caregivers, the people who work in this business, that's where we learn very profound life lessons is when we have those honest conversations. And um, it's not about entertainment or cheering people up. So any other chats out there? I've got one. Um, would elder speak when it's used be considered or fall into the category of a microaggression? Yes, absolutely. And I, I feel very strongly about that uh, because as I talked about that gap, usually when we dehumanize someone, it, it is that danger zone where it's the I, it, and not the I, thou. Um, I, studies in Sweden have considered it, and that's when I was doing my writing, consider it elder abuse. So I, um, we aren't quite that far here, uh, but, but yes, that's it's a aggression too. Interesting. Do we, I don't have anything else in the chat. Does anybody else have something to say or to, to ask, have another question? Thank you so much, everyone, for coming tonight. Yeah. Okay. So I will quick. I will move on here, Patty. Okay. Um, I want to thank you first of all for this very original and informative presentation that was really interesting. And for participants, just to review, if you haven't already, um, excuse me. Um, let me move on from that. We would like to invite you to visit the Cassia website to register for our upcoming webinar. The Enneagram and You, presented by Nancy Carlson, who's Vice President of Spiritual Life at Cassia. It promises to be a lively yet useful look at the Enneagram personality inventory and how it can be a guidepost for life. Have fun taking the Enneagram type test yourself before joining us on Wednesday, May 26th at 6 p.m. for Nancy Carlson's presentation. And you can go online at cassialife.org to register for that one, probably in the upcoming few days, it will be posted there. And lastly, if you have any follow-up questions, something that comes to mind after we end tonight, please feel free to, uh, I just, somebody just said, um, is that Eastern time for the webinars? No, they're all central, they're all central time. They're all originating here uh, in Minneapolis, in Minnesota. But you can feel free to call me or send me an email and I will um, get answers to any questions. I can send you, um, uh, also Pat Patty, I believe you said you, you, that you could supply um, bibliography or, or sources, that sort of thing. And if people need CEUs, they should just- Yes, and they CEUs. should also, yeah, you can email me for CEUs as well. And Patty, I can't remember if you're, are you, um, is, are you making the um, PowerPoint available? I, I certainly can. You can, okay, they, they, because this will be recorded, that would be part of the full recording, mm -hmm. um, the visual along with the audio of this talk. So, so it, you know, it may take a few days for that to get posted, but I can share information on that as well. And then they can all have pictures of my grandparents. So. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. It would be wonderful. All right. Well, that's really that we've come to the end here. I think we um, got ju just close to, to seven o'clock. And I, again, thanks everybody for joining. And I hope we do see you for Enneagrams. Thank you, Patty. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>